What I'm showing you today is my Sony A7 III camera. Check it out, it looks gorgeous. Sony A7 III over here. And I'm gonna be showing you my setup guide for video shooting, not photography, but purely video shooting. I'm gonna talk firstly about the features that I love, just the beginning. So it does have two ports. This is a USB-C and this is a micro USB. Both ports can be used to charge the battery inside. Now, this battery over here, this guy, I have not actually taken it out of the cage itself because it, it lasts three hours. You can record up to three hours of 4K footage. I got myself a spare Z battery, but as you can see, it's still cased up. So it's very, very convenient being able to charge the battery directly from the camera itself. Of course, after three hours, switching out the battery is something you should do. And not having a charger means that the second battery may not always be charged, but being able to charge and run the camera using the external power bank, using these two ports is very, very useful. So you guys are still going, Sinbench R20. The SD cards, they go here. I only use one SD card. I know there's a lot of people saying you should always use two because if this guy fails, being able to record to a second card is a lifesaver. But for me, I'm using one of these guys. This is a SanDisk Extreme. I've been using it for a good two, two years now and I've had no problems with it. When I transfer my files over to my MacBook Pro, I also use these two ports. So you can use these two ports to transfer files to your computer, as well as charge the camera, as well as power the camera. It's very, very versatile. There is one problem with the lower port, however. It's very close to this weather seal attachment. So you can get the cable a bit stuck and fiddly over here. You do get used to it in time, but that is one of the irks. Using USB-C is a lot more easier. Second up I wanna show you is, there's a difference between this three and a half millimeter jack and this three and a half millimeter jack. And this is a novice mistake, but the first time I was recording audio, I was plugging my microphone in this port, but you should be plugging it in the red. This one allows you to plug in a headphone jack to listen to the audio being recorded in the microphone to make sure you're not recording too loud or you are actually recording, all that kind of stuff. So just make sure you plug in a microphone in this port, not that one. You also get a mini HDMI. I'll plug in the HDMI, the other end, into my camera. I'm using a HDMI to mini HDMI converter because that's what my Sony camera supports. This dial is something to be careful of. Now, this is an exposure compensation dial. So if you press plus three, plus two, plus one, it makes the screen brighter, or it records the footage brighter too. And if you make it minus, it records the footage darker. Now this is a kind of like hint to tell the camera to record brighter or darker. However, every now and then, maybe because I'm playing with the shutter or every single now and then when this gets knocked around, it can change the position. So always look at this portion of the screen. If it says plus two, that means it's not at zero because if you're shooting outside and you don't have an ND filter on the front and you set it up to be plus two, the screen's gonna be overblown and you're gonna be recording some insanely bright footage. So just always keep it at zero and you'll be happy. Couple of tricks, you can set up this shutter button to start recording if you're in movie mode. And you can also use this record button to record. Personally, I prefer using this one because it's a lot easier, softer to press, whereas this one's kind of like, it, it can shake the camera a bit. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day, but I find it really nicely positioned just to press that button over here. For me, the way I have my camera set up, when I press the down button, it switches between full frame and APS-C mode. APS-C allows you to zoom in 1.5, losing a tiny bit of quality, not that much quality, but full frame gets you more screen real estate. So for me, I just use this as a quick zoom. Unfortunately, you can't switch 
while your recording is in effect. So from recording over here, pressing down will do nothing. What I've configured though is the left button to allow you to zoom. So I've given a 4x zoom in and out. Unfortunately, this zoom is digital. So if I'm not getting enough reach using my lens, I can throw out an extra zoom using this and zoom in up to 4x speed. Next up also, I set my middle button to switch between autofocus, continuous autofocus and manual focus. Reason why I do this is while this camera does have amazing focus, pretty much trust it with all my work, at nighttime in low light, the autofocus sucks. So the only way to get good shots is to switch to manual and use this ring of the lens to kind of like fine tune your target. And it's really easy to do once you get the hang of it, you kind of like overshoot it and then undershoot it and fine tune it. Because at nighttime, you can't rely on autofocus of the camera. Regarding my movie mode recording, at the moment I'm using shutter priority. What that does is it lets me control the shutter speed. And I tend to use one over a hundred because I find that's the motion that I kind of like in my videos. However, most people kind of like shoot at 2x their frame rate. So in this case, it'll be 50, but I prefer 100. I love leaving my shutter locked in at one level because when you do use a variable shutter, the footage goes between high motion, really, really crazy blur to insanely erratic shutter speeds. Because if you use a really low shutter speed, the footage gets brighter, but it also gets a lot blurrier. Whereas if you use an insanely high shutter speed, the footage gets darker, but not in this case, because I'm using the ISO to compensate, but the footage gets darker, but it kind of looks like it's all high octane and erratic and all the little jitters are noticeable. So I kind of keep like to keep this locked in at one over hundred. You choose your setting and it will automatically drive the ISO and the aperture for me. Now, the bad side about this is, as you can see right here, look at that, the, the aperture is constantly being fiddled around with now aperture that controls the amount of background blur you get in your videos and if you don't have an nd filter it's going to play with the background blur as it gets brighter so if it goes to a bright light it's going to switch up to a high aperture and if you get to a dark area it's going to switch up to a low aperture because it's going to open it up reason why it does this is because if the scene is too bright all your footage is going to be very very bright and overblown and you can't recover that in post so it will play with the aperture to make it smaller so less light gets to the sensor and your video quality and your videos will come out to be lit evenly and well iso i set that to auto now something to note the minimum iso for video is 100 you can't go less than that However, the maximum is, whew, look at that insanely bright. It goes all the way up to 200,000. Now, when you do go 200,000, the quality gets pretty bad. I'd say 50,000 is pretty usable. The less the eyes are, the better, of course. But I tend to trust the camera picking the eyes off for me, and I tend to trust it picking the aperture for me and I just make sure that the shutter speed is locked because when I allow it control of the shutter speed because if you do that sometimes the footage will be re being recorded perfectly fine but then if you get in a dark area it will reduce the shutter speed and you'll make the footage overly blurry and if you get to a really bright area it will increase the shutter speed and make the footage look very erratic so it's always best to just lock that one down in to the value that you like. I like one over hundred, but your mileage may vary, especially if you're recording. Right? And you know, that's uh, pretty much the majority of my button layout. I mean, I got an AF on button, but to be honest, AF autofocus is always on. And if you look at my iconography, there's an airplane mode right there. What that means is Wi-Fi and Bluetooth is disabled. Now, if I was to turn off airplane mode, Look at that AF on 
right there. If I start to record, face detection, AF will be off. When recording at 4K, it can't do face detection continuous autofocus if you have a Wi-Fi connection. So you need to wait for Wi-Fi to turn on and then turn on airplane mode. And then you'll be able to record with face detection autofocus. Now face detection autofocus is actually very, very, very useful for if you're recording yourself or other actors because it will lock onto the face over, for example, a box. So if I've got a, a face here and a box here, it will detect that face and lock in focus on this guy rather than this Chinese box. So face detection just gives priority to the face when detecting objects. And that's very useful so you don't get the focus constantly switching between two different objects. It just locks in or whatever it detects as faces and it does do multiple faces at a time. One more note on having airplane mode on. I've used some wireless mics, for example, the Filmmaker Kit by Rode. And it does give a light little hissing sound when you have Wi-Fi on on the camera. So again, if you're recording with a wireless microphone, especially one that broadcasts on a 2.4 gigahertz range, always turn on airplane mode because it gets rid of that hiss. Next up, I'm going to show you the function menu. And I haven't really customized this guy. All I've really done is gone inside the creative style and I've kind of tweaked my own color scheme because I didn't like the standard colors that were coming out of this. So I picked neutral, but I did tweak it. So what I've got here is I've got it minus two contrast and zero, zero. And what I like about this is it kind of reduces the saturation in my footage because I'm using neutral and it reduces the contrast, makes it a little bit darker and I can brighten it up in post. I find it's always nicer to record a bit darker and boost it if I need it, rather than recording normal and having to darken the footage in post. It just looks a lot nicer to me. That's my workflow. And regarding these function buttons, my focus area, I just pick wide. That's the best one. Exposure compensation, well, I've got it at zero. You wanna lock in zero if possible, but unfortunately you can't. So you have to always just make sure it's at zero. ISO is at auto. You can play with it by, I like making it auto. Metering mode, I use multi, it works really well. Exposure mode, I like giving shutter priority because I can lock in the shutter speed. And white balance, I set it to auto, works really well. And flash, I don't use a flash, so that's all good. That's kind of like my setup and use case for it. And all I really do when I'm recording, I just Make sure that shutter speed is 100, make sure exposure compensation is at zero, and I hit that button to record, or even the shutter button to record. And when I can play, if I want to modify the ISO, I press right. If I want to zoom in, I press left and I zoom in. But I tend to not use that feature unless I really need it. If I want to switch to manual focus and autofocus, I tap the middle button. And if I want to give an APS-C zoom, which is higher quality than using the digital zoom, I hit the down button to switch between APS-C and full frame. I also made my bin button, rather than using wide focus detection, it switches to center point focus detection. And I can just quickly zoom in there, make sure I'm on the right focus. But to be honest, I don't tend to use this one unless I'm getting some crazy auto focus detection. Now there are more features to do with focus. For example, you can customize this button to select an object for it to lock focus on. So over here I can lock onto an object and then it will constantly focus in on that object. I tend to not use that because I find that the wide detection works really well. And I've even disabled the touch screen because I find that it sometimes registers accidental taps and it kind of like, hey, starts focusing starts focusing in on things I don't really want it to focus on. So I kind of disable the touch screen. I don't use this point focus system. I just set it to wide and I only switch to manual when I want to play around with the focus. That's myself. It's very easy. You just make sure that shutter speed is at 100 
and it kind of does everything else for you. Now, there are cases where you might want to ramp up the shutter speed. For example, if the scene is too bright outside and you don't have an ND filter to darken it up, you can ramp up the, the shutter speed. And it's kind of useful to ramp up the shutter speed in those cases. Just make sure you apply a motion blur on your footage in post, because that will give it that life back and maybe a bit of stabilization to compensate for all your erraticness. Now, this camera does have in body stabilization and the lens, this is the kit lens, also has lens stabilization. However, it's not the most stabilized camera. It's very, very basic stabilization. I had a G85 before and that was super smooth and very stabilized. The GH5 was super, super smooth and very stabilized. This guy is worse than both. It's not unstabilized, but it's just, it's better than nothing. That's all I'd say about that. So you still need to have a nice steady grip and make sure you hold it like, like you know, you wanna take care of your footage. Now I'm just gonna go through some extras that you might not be aware of. You might have heard that this camera has eye autofocus. In movie mode, you don't have eye autofocus. That doesn't work in that, it only works in photograph mode. This screen does expand out, but of course you can't flip it to a selfie mode so you can't see yourself. Technically, I mean, it's just a ribbon cable over there. So if you're willing to void your warranty, you should be able to unscrew these parts and maybe fiddle around with it and flip it upwards. Or maybe even this bottom part, flip it downwards, flip it downwards. However, I've left mine as it is. Next up, this camera can run in two different modes. It's PAL and NTSC. NTSC allows you to record 30 frames a second 4K and 120 frames a second full HD. So you can do slow-mo, extra speed, and, 40 frame, and 30 frames a second 4K. However, the problem is when you do shoot at 30 frames a second, there is an additional crop. It's about 10% crop. And I'm using the kit lens here, and that's 28 millimeters. 28 millimeters without the crop is about the same as my smartphone, slightly wider actually, but with a 10% crop, you're really pushing in a bit too much for my preference. So what I do is I switch over to PAL, and that, and that allows me to record at 25 frames a second, one more frame than 24, without any crop. Unfortunately, the negative of that is full HD, Slow-mo, that one only goes up to 100 frames a second. So you're losing out 20 frames in full HD, but you're gaining one frame over the 24 of NTSC. Some other tips, if you do want this manual zoom, just make sure you don't use RAW. It only is supported if you record JPEG stills. So if you're doing photography, you got to set it to JPEG mode. SNQ mode is kind of like a slow motion for you. However, that guy doesn't record any audio. So I tend to avoid S and Q. And what I've done, I've set up my custom buttons to be slow motion. So I've got number two. And that guy records 100 frames a second full HD. And I've got the main one. That guy records 4K 25p. And I've got number one. That guy records full HD 25p but a low bit rate. This is like if I'm just recording some nonsense just that I wanna play around with. All right, now I'm just gonna quickly jump in to the menu settings just to show you how I've set it up. So first, playback. When you go to view some of the footage you've already recorded, just press down and make sure it's on the maximum volume. And I'm gonna just press the playback button to get back into the main screen, hit menu. And I'm gonna go into menu number one and first up, again, my file format, I set it to JPEG. For this one, you need to switch to manual so you can see this footage because menu number one is to do with photography, menu number two is to do with videography, videoing, menu number three is to do with network, extra stuff, then you got playback, then you got setup, and then you got your bonus menu. And I'll show you what I use. So I've switched over here to manual just to show you settings for photography. And I've got file format as JPEG, I use compressed, extra fine quality, that's the maximum one, and the large version. Aspect ratio, aspect ratio is 3.2, which gives me a full sense readout. When you're doing videos, it crops the sensor to get that widescreen effect, but if you're doing stuff for Instagram, you wanna get 
as tall as possible to capture as much of the image. This one over here, and camera one, two, memory. This one is to save all the settings you've done into one of these custom one, two setting buttons. So just say, for example, like I've done, you wanna have one record at 25p and you other one to record at 100p. You select, for example, let's say 100p over here. And then you go into screen number three of menu number one, hit memory. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna save it into number one. I hit save. So at the moment in movie mode, it's 4K 25p. But when I switch to number one, hit that. And it's now full HD 100p. So that's how you use the memory settings button. I have pre-AF on, and when you take pictures, if you just lightly press on that, it's gonna autofocus before capturing the shot. My spot metering point, I link that to the focus because you can meter the brightness of the screen on the center point or depending on who you're looking at. So I like to meter the brightness of the screen depending on who I'm focused on. I turn on anti-flicker shooting. This helps out in areas where you're using halogen lights and they flicker at a different rate. All right, next up, I'm gonna show you the movie menu and exposure mode. Again, I set that to shutter priority. So that way I can lock in the shutter and it sorts out the aperture and the ISO itself. File format, I pick 4K. I record at 25 at 100 megabits. I try, I always make sure I record as high as possible because you can always reduce it and convert it to HEVC in post. So that's what I tend to do and I reduce the file size by like 90% and I keep a lot of the quality. Price recording, I have that set to off. AF speed, I have that at fast. And tracking sensitivity, I have that at responsive. It's pretty much the maximum ones. When you slow it down, it just is a bit too slow for me. I don't like the, the quality of that. So I make sure it's on maximum. Auto slow shutter, that's on. Audio recording is on. Audio record level, that really depends on the microphone that you're using. So just look at that label point here. And if I, it, you see that green, it's because it's really hot at the moment. I'm talking, but if you reduce it down there, you'll find a level that you can kind of like hear what's going on. And um, it really depends on the microphone that you plugged in inside it. You do have to change this every single time you plug in a different microphone. So I have this as a hot menu and I'll show you how to set up that yourself. I have the audio display on because I want to see the levels that's being recorded to make sure I'm not recording um, too hot. Movie with shutter that allows you to record videos with this button. By default, if you have that off, it will just complain that you tap the shutter button and it won't record. Whereas in movie mode, if you have movie with shutter on, it'll start recording with that. So that's a pretty one, good one to have. Steady shot I have turned on. Does that do anything? To be honest, maybe, maybe, but the quality of in-body in stabilization is very low, so it's not amazing. Again, I use digital zoom. You get three options of zooming. Optical only means you can only use the lens. Clear image is meant to be lossless, so when you zoom, you don't lose any of the quality. However, digital zoom, that gives you the maximum reach. I don't use digital zoom unless I feel like it's necessary, but it does give me extra reach. So I can zoom in and do some Huawei P30 Pro style dodginess. Find a monitor, I set that to manual. And grid line, I use the rule of thirds that helps me orient my shot because I get a nice grid and I know where my edges are. So it helps me compose my frame. All right, that's enough of that. You get extra menus, auto review, I have that off. Basically after recording, it will tell you, hey, do you wanna see this film? I always have that off. These ones I'm gonna come back to, these are gonna be custom keys. And I do have customized my keys, as you can see over here. My wheel is not set. My custom button one is for white balance. Number two is focus area, number three, is focus mode, number four is audio signals. My middle one switches the focus. My center one does eye autofocus. Left one does the zoom, right one does ISO. Down button switches to APS-C. And you gotta understand, you gotta set up the custom keys for each of the modes. So when you're in picture mode, that's manual, you get custom keys. And then when you're in movie mode, you get different custom keys. But for here, I've got it to just follow the picture mode other than custom button four, which is a focus magnifier, which allows me to just zoom in 
and see what exactly I'm focusing on. Because sometimes it's a small screen, you can't exactly see what's going on. And I've also made the center button here to be autofocus manual and uh, automatic a toggle. Left button zoom, because you really just follow, follow, follow. And the playback, you get to follow or protect and send to smartphone. Now setting up your smartphone is, uh, you just use control of smartphone. However, it won't be enabled unless you have Wi-Fi mode turned on, whereas I have airplane mode turned on. Wi-Fi settings, you can just set up your access point. Bluetooth settings, to be honest, turn it off. It doesn't do anything. I've tried connecting to my smartphone with Bluetooth. It, you can't download pictures or anything like that with it. It's a shame, because it would have been awesome if you can add a connection, but that doesn't really do much. Monitor brightness, I sent that to pretty much the maximum one. Power save time, after five minutes, the camera will automatically turn off. I find that's a good amount of time. Auto power off temperature, I set it to high. I've never had this camera overheat, and I've never seen the high temperature warning, but I live in Australia, so I set it to high just in case it does want to overheat because I want it to record as much footage as possible. I've, I've actually had this camera shoot three hours of footage non-stop, just to keep on hitting the record button after every half an hour. And again, I live in Australia, so it works pretty well. I have touch operation turned off, that way it doesn't register any dodgy presses on the screen. Connection, my USB connection is automatically by default mass storage. So whenever I plug the camera via USB to my computer, it appears as a drive on my computer and I can just transfer over the files directly. And this one allows you to format your disk. You can set up copyright info, I don't really do that. File number, I set up as a series and this is the prefix file name, but I have an import script on my computer where every single time I download the footage from my computer, from the camera to my computer, it automatically renames the files based on its timestamps. And yeah, that's it. My version is version 3.0.1. Unfortunately, while they do provide a firmware update for Mac, I've never actually got it to work on Mac OS, so what I do is I install the Windows firmware update using a virtual machine called Parallels and it works completely fine over there and you can also do it in Bootcamp. All right, that's just a, a deep dive into the world of A7 III. I tried to make this video as boring but comprehensive as possible. Again, I'm just using the basic A7 III with the basic kit lens and it works really well. The only reason why I'm doing this video is because I'm hoping to remember all this information because I'm currently sending this camera off for a repair. Uh, this microphone board port is damaged and Sony said it's going to take about two weeks for them to repair it. So I'm sending it off tomorrow and I'm hoping when it comes back I can just watch back this video and remember all my settings. Have I missed something out? Let me know and uh, enjoy the beautiful footage you're about to see.